Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Uh, We're here to realize our dreams of being leaders of a book club. It's always something I wanted to do. It's not a very official book club. There's not a book discussion so much. Uh, You and I are discussing it. But true. It's a book club of two that other people can listen to if they want. And then they can give us their thoughts Mm -hmm. in comment form. Of course they can. They should. So before we jump into Untamed, which so good. Can't wait to talk about this. Everything Glennon writes is so Um, good. So before we jump into Untamed, I want to remind you that there is officially one week left of the kind of special offerings we are doing during this pandemic season. And I also want to remind you that as of today, I promise, as of recording this, this isn't true, but by the time you listen, this will be true. We have now added as a bonus to the Passion Profile short course, one of the things that's heavily discounted right now. It's our intro course that's only 50%. It is 50% 50 off. off. It's only half (laughs) off. We added a bonus to that called the Dream Job Bundle. Some of you may have heard us talk about that a couple of weeks ago, or you've heard of, you know, you've heard us mention it in the past. It's a bonus that was previously with one of our other courses, but then we retired that course. And so now we're deciding to add it to this one because it's a little compilation of all of the resources and activities and some example cover letters and resumes and stuff like that, that helps you apply for jobs in a conscious way. Because I think that a lot of the time, you can get really clear on who you are and what you want. And then when push comes to shove or the rubber hits the road, you kind of revert into some of your old habits because it's stressful and it's not fun to look for a job or to apply for it. Like, it's not fun. So to try to make the process a little bit, not maybe more enjoyable. Smoother. Smoother, because I don't think it's ever going to be fun. Supported. Yeah, and just conscious. The Passion Profile short course itself is going to help set your compass on what kinds of jobs and what kind of characteristics of jobs should I be looking for. And then this bonus takes it to the next level, which is, okay, how do I now go get that job? Yeah. And so we want you to have access to that so you can go through that whole life cycle. I think that you'll really like it. I just had one of my clients, um, I had a last call with her yesterday, which I was always sad when... I've been talking to someone for seven seven months with her, and it was our last call, and she said that she used it to help her plan out some interview questions for a job she's really excited about. She said it went very well. She's had multiple interviews, and she's fingers crossed for an offer. The interview question part of that, I think, is On point. It is on point. So I think that you guys will like, we've got example documents in there of great resumes, both skills-based and traditional. We've got some cover letters. We've got some a worksheet if- to help you pump yourself up. Yeah. We've got one to help you draft good interview questions. And I decided to leave in the interviews we've done with people about getting their dream job, which are not podcast interviews. They are separate that we did a few years ago when we created the dream job bundle. I was like, yes, these are a little bit older, but I mean, wisdom doesn't really fade. So I'm mm-hmm. going to leave those in there. So there's interviews with people that we have worked with either in the in courses or one-on-one about how they've used some of this stuff to get their dream I believe job. we also have examples of if you want to reach out to someone for an informational interview. Yeah, yeah it's all in there. it's awkward. I have a lot of clients who would tell it's me, so I want to reach out to someone, but it feels really weird. We, we literally give you the language to do it. Yeah. So if that sounds intriguing, remember, the Passion Profile Short Course is, that's, that bonus is now part of the PPSC. So until June 5th, that course is 50% off. So it's like 125. That's literally it. It'll go back to its normal price, which is around 250 on June 6th. 
So June 5th, next Friday, will be your last day. You can also bundle that, which a lot of people are doing. The bundle is popular with a single coaching session, which, you know, we don't do single coaching sessions normally. Or you can buy a single, you can just do a single session. I'm finding that it's, it's, it's a cool experience to do the bundle. People are taking the course and then we have a session and they've already done some of this pre-work. Yeah. So they come into it really ready to jump into the session. Yeah. So I, I see why it. people are bundling it. And then having now done many of them, it's it's a cool experience. It is. And it's not going to last much longer no. because we can't. One week longer. That's we don't it. have the capacity to do single sessions for anyone and everyone who wants one, like indefinitely. I'm already sort of feeling strained at times, which just means we plan them out a few weeks and it, you know, we just... Yeah. Our calendars fill up. I mean, Yeah, just... I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> uh, so that is going to be all ending in a week. So go to either clarityonfire.com slash pandemic. Uh, I continue to apologize for that <laughs> URL, but it is memorable. <laughs> or you can go to the show notes and click any of the links there. And if you want to do the bundle, you can... Um, it's not a separate page. You just... If you want to do a bundle, you go to the short course. Really, you can go to either page, but go to the short course page. And then when you're checking out, you can add a single session at checkout. Not hard. You will figure it out. Yep. Okay, so... It's book club time. uh, 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 We haven't had one in a while. I'm 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 always so excited when we get to do a book club. The last time we did a book club was a very different universe that we lived in. It's true. (laughs) Also, I love when I'm reading and I'm like setting aside time to read. I'm like, this is for work. Yeah. (laughs) I deserve this reading time. This is for my job. Yeah. <laughs> As if you shouldn't read all the time. Exactly. But it feels like you have permission or something. <laughs> Even though I gave myself permission. You also gave yourself your job. I know. By the way. That's what no I mean. No one actually is in charge of you. That's what I mean. But it still um, feels better somehow. Okay. Good. So, okay. Let me just give you guys the quick and dirty on Glennon Doyle, who wrote Untamed. So, for those of you, few people who have not heard of her... She is a mega best-selling author. She's written multiple books. She is a former addict. She's in recovery. She has a very complicated relationship with Christianity. She used to identify more as like a Christian mommy blogger. That's often how sites and like news articles would refer to her, which she would kind of roll her eyes at, even though it was kind of true. Uh, she got sober when she was 26, when... And I, we're talking like she had a long history of bulimia since she was 10 years old. She's one of the more highly sensitive people you could ever yes. encounter. And in order to, we talk about that in this outline that I've written up. Um, but she became bulimic at 10. And then when she got older, she, you know, she it, it expanded into alcoholism and drug abuse. And so for about 16 years straight, she was a hardcore addict. Only decided to go into recovery when she found out unexpectedly that she was pregnant. For the second time. This time she decided she was going to become a mom. So she married the father of her baby, and then they had two more kids. And she just kind of became a great mom. That was her new identity. And then she found out that her husband had been cheating on her for the entirety of their marriage without telling her. And that book is Love Warrior, which please, please read Love Warrior 2. It is the book about her coming to terms with her addiction and the fact that just because she became so sober doesn't mean that she stopped being an addict. And she realized, I married an addict. I was an addict and I yeah. married one. And then that it, it is the story of her coming to terms with herself and her marriage and them coming back together. And Untamed is the story of how she decided ultimately to leave her marriage after they had quote unquote fixed it. Because even though they both had gotten better and they'd done so much therapy and they had sort of healed themselves, she fell in love with a woman, Abby Abby Wambach, the the famous Olympic soccer soccer player. (laughs) (laughs) And I I don't actually read any of the parts about her meeting Abby that is worth reading this book for. The story is so great. It's It's, amazing. It's kind of like a modern day fairy tale, how they fell in love, frankly. It really is. And so we'll get into, there are some parts of her, really, so a lot of this book, Untamed is about so many things. It's hard to say what Untamed is about. But the premise of Untamed is that in order for her to walk away from her marriage to a man, in a Christian community, you know, where it the sort of underlying or, you know, overarching belief is you stay and you work on your marriage and you don't leave, even when 
it's not making you happy. And even though you've done all of this work, it still doesn't feel like the truest expression of who you are. How do you walk away from that and start a relationship with a woman? And and it wasn't about, this is like such an important point of this book. Her walking away from the mar- from her marriage was not actually about Abby. It was about, this is no longer good for me. What, and I love Abby. What she recognized in herself right. as she was falling in love with Abby made her realize that old life is not a yeah. true expression of me. And whether this new life is with Abby or not, I now have seen a glimpse of what's possible. And, and I, I can't, can't go back can't to stay. where I was. That's exactly it. And this book is really about uh, disentangling a lot of the social constructs All that get programming. put onto us. And we often don't even see it or recognize it. Especially as women. Especially as women. This book is, I mean, this book is really written for women. I I hope some men will read it too. I hope you do, because you might experience a lot of uh, resonance and or you might understand women better. Sure. Um, But she's really writing this to women who have taken on a lot of social programming. And this is her journey of untangling herself from that and her kind of shining the spotlight for other women to Un- remove that from themselves as well. Maybe not untangling, but untaming. That's exactly. what this book is about. Exactly. It's about becoming free and realizing in how many places you have caged yourself. And so with that, I'm going to start. So Kristen, you know It was how- so hard for us to oh choose my God. a few things to share with you guys. Honestly, please re- just read the book. <laughs> We're going like, to share some... This does not suffice as... as no. <laughs> We're going to share some of the highlights, but it's all highlights, so just read it. So here's a good... This is at the very beginning. This is a good kind of snippet of what I feel like the book is about. She says, I've done my research and learned this. 10 is when we learn how to be good girls and real boys. 10 is when children begin to hide who they are in order to become what the world expects them to be. Right around 10 is when we begin to internalize our formal training. 10 is when the world sat me down, told me to be quiet, and pointed toward my cages. These are the feelings you're allowed to express. This is how a woman should act. This is the body you must strive for. These are the things you will believe. These are the people you can love. Those are the people you should fear. This is the kind of life you're supposed to want. Make yourself fit. You'll be uncomfortable at first, but don't worry. Eventually, you'll forget you're caged. Soon, this will just feel like life. I wanted to be a good girl, so I tried to control myself. I chose a personality, a body, a faith, a sexuality so tiny I had to hold my breath to fit myself inside. Then, I promptly became very sick. When I became a good girl, I also became a bulimic. None of us can hold our breath all the time. Bulimia was where I exhaled. It was where I refused to comply indulged my hunger, and expressed my fury. I became animalistic during my daily binges. Then I draped myself over the toilet and purged because a good girl must stay very small to fit inside her cages. She must leave no outward evidence of her hunger. Good girls aren't hungry, furious, or wild. All of the things that make a woman human are a good girl's dirty secret. Back then, I suspected that my bulimia meant that I was crazy. In high school, I did a stint in a mental hospital and my suspicion was confirmed. I understand myself differently now. I was just a caged girl made for wide open skies. It just breaks my heart that a 10-year-old Glennon was binging and purging like that. But think about it. 10 is, what, early middle school? I mean, that is where... No, that's late elementary school. It's, yeah, it's like that bridge between being a kid and starting to be an adolescent. And it's, it's heartbreaking to see the awkwardness and the self-consciousness because little kids, man, they are just themselves for the most part. Yeah, And we start to lose that. We start to cage ourselves in, like she said, and it's... And Glennon is a highly sensitive and so much of what she experiences, so much of, I think, and, and you read about this in Love Warrior, so much of why she turned to bulimia was because she couldn't handle how much she was feeling yes, at all numbing. times. And she didn't have an outlet for it. And so she turned to things to either become the outlet for expressing her feelings or to numb the feelings that she was having. And I and it's interesting because then the next thing that you're going to read is about her daughter. Her daughter's who also... Who is super highly sensitive. And now she's having to parent someone just like her, which I think is karmically a really great lesson for you. It is. You, um, and she's, she, I've heard her say on interviews, I thought it would be easier to parent a highly sensitive because I am one. 
No, it's just hard. It's just just so hard. Really hard. So you're going to read this thing about Tish's obsession Uh, with polar bears. This is one of my favorite stories in this whole book. So her daughter Tish is in, I forget which, what grade she's she's like around 10 to 12. She's in that same same age range. And her teacher is explaining the effect of global, global warming and talking about how the ice caps are melting and how it's killing the polar bears. I think she showed a picture of a she starving a, polar bear. She did. She showed a picture of a polar bear uh, An emaciated one. And all the other kids are like... Sad for a minute. They're sad. And then they're like, okay, it's recess time. And they go to recess. So we're going to read Tisha's response to yeah. learning this information about polar bears. Tish couldn't go to recess. Because she was paying attention to what her teacher said. As soon as she heard the polar bear news, she let herself feel feel the horror and know the wrongness and imagine the inevitable outcome. Tish is sensitive, and that is her superpower. The opposite of sensitive is not brave. It's not brave to refuse to pay attention, to refuse to notice, to refuse to feel and know and imagine. The opposite of sensitive is insensitive. And that's no badge of honor. Tish senses. Even as the world tries to speed by her, she is slowly taking it in. Wait, stop. That thing you said about the polar bears. It made me feel something and wonder something. Can we stay there for a moment? I have feelings. I have questions. I'm not ready to run outside to recess yet. In most cultures, folks like Tish are identified early set apart as shamans, medicine people, poets, and clergy. They are considered eccentric, but critical to the survival of the group because they're able to hear things others don't hear and see things others don't see and feel things others don't feel. The culture depends on the sensitivity of a few because nothing can be healed if it's not sensed first. But our society is so hell-bent on expansion, power, and efficiency at all costs that the folks like Tish, like me, are inconvenient. We slow the world down. We're on the bow of the Titanic, pointing, crying out, iceberg, iceberg, while everyone else is below deck yelling back, we just want to keep dancing. It's easier to call us broken and dismiss us than to consider what, that what we are responding appropriately to is a broken world. This is... I think why her daughter is very lucky to have her as a mom, because I don't know that even though she has really great parents that she talks about in this book, I don't think there was anyone there when she was 10 and binged and purged for the first time. Nobody understood what was behind all that. To understand her feelings and to validate them and to tell her that she didn't have to try to make, to break herself to fit in with a broken world. And you know, Tish is the only one sitting there feeling like this, there's something wrong with this. And I think that this is what happens. And this is what happened to Glennon. And I'm so glad it's not happening to her kid. That when, you, when you're having all of those feelings and when you feel like there's something wrong here or when I'm having all of this emotional experience and I can't relate to anyone and no one can relate to me, there must be something wrong with me. And so we must try to control it. We must try to tamp it down. We must try not to feel it. And in trying not to feel it, that's when we create real problems for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, and Glennon even says in the book and and outside of it too, she's like, I started to get so sick of hearing about polar bears. And even me, someone who's really, really sensitive (laughs) and feels the world, it was like, okay, can we get on with this already? Like, stop talking about this. And Tish would keep being like, no, like, (laughs) this is so pay attention. Something is wrong here. Yeah. And eventually she even says something like, mom, it's the polar bears now, but eventually if nobody cares, it's going to be us. Yeah. No one cares about the polar bears now. So eventually it's going to be us and no one will care. Exactly. And then Glennon was like, like, oh God, I care about the polar bears now. (laughs) (laughs) But that's what sensitivity will do for you. Will do when you hear it, when you give it space. Yeah. Is it'll show you we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. We got to pull back. So a big part of untaming is to honor your sensitivity and to stop believing that you're broken and to maybe believe that the way that you feel is a, an appropriate response to an often very broken world. Yep. So Glennon has 
like part two of this book, I literally just, that was all of part one. I, I'm sad that I can't go into every <laughs> single thing. Part two of this book are what she kind of is referring to as the keys to freedom, like the, the keys that set her free. And here's the poem that she has as the prelude to this section. It's by, you know, the ancient mystic Hafez. Um, it's called Dropping Keys. The small woman builds cages for everyone she knows, while the sage, who has to duck her head when the moon is low, keeps dropping keys all night long for the beautiful, rowdy prisoners. Ah, so good. That's what this book is. It's her dropping keys for the beautiful, rowdy prisoners (laughs) saying, free yourself from this shit that has caged you. So we, I I kind of pulled a few bullets about some of the keys that are important when, when freeing and untaming. Okay, this is the very first one. And really, the essence of this one is feel everything. This is what we were talking about with Tish already. But Feel it all. Taking it to the next level. On my sixth day of sobriety, I went to my fifth recovery meeting. I sat in a cold plastic seat, trembling, trying to keep the coffee from spilling out of my paper cup and feeling, and (laughs) and my feelings from spilling out of my skin. For 16 years, I had made damn sure that nothing touched me. And suddenly... Everything in the world was touching me. I was an exposed nerve. Everything hurt. I was embarrassed to tell anyone how much I hurt, but I decided to try to explain it to the people in that circle. They were the first people I trusted with all of me because they were the first people I ever heard tell the whole truth. They had shown me their insides, so I showed them mine. I said something like, I'm Glennon and I've been sober for six days. I feel awful. I think this awfulness is why I started drinking in the first place. I'm starting to worry that what was wrong with me wasn't the booze. It was underneath it. It was me. It doesn't seem like being alive is as hard for other people as it is for me. It just feels like there's some kind of secret to life that I don't know. Like I'm doing it all wrong. Thanks for listening. After the meeting ended, a woman walked over and sat down next to me. She said, thanks for sharing. I relate. I just wanted to tell you something that somebody told me in the beginning. It's okay to feel all of the stuff you're feeling. You're just becoming human again. You're not doing life wrong. You're you're doing it right. If there's any secret you're missing, it's that doing it right is just really hard. Feeling all your feelings is hard, but that's what they're for. Feelings are for feeling. All of them, even the hard ones. The secret is that you're doing it right and that doing it right hurts sometimes. I did not know before that woman told me that all feelings were for feeling. I did not know that I was supposed to feel everything. I thought I was supposed to feel happy. I thought that happy was for feeling and that pain was for fixing and numbing and deflecting and hiding and ignoring. I thought that when life got hard, it was because I had gone wrong somewhere. I thought that pain was weakness and that I was supposed to suck it up. But the thing that the more the thing was, the more I sucked it up, the more food and booze I had to suck down. That day, I began returning to myself, fearful and trembling, pregnant and six days sober, in a church basement with shitty fluorescent lights and terrible coffee, when a kind woman revealed to me that being fully human is not about feeling happy. It's about feeling everything. From that day forward, I began to practice feeling it all. I began to insist upon my right and my responsibility to feel it all, even when taking the time and energy for feeling made me feel a little less efficient, a little less convenient, and a little less pleasant. Yeah, feelings, all of them are valid. There is no wrong feeling to be having. I don't feel like we all had that woman growing up to Uh, tell us. No, we definitely did not. All of your feelings are valid. They're yeah. all for feeling. And that doesn't mean you have to like it. No. And no. just because you're feeling bad doesn't mean anything is wrong. In fact, sometimes feeling bad is the appropriate response to a broken or difficult or painful situation. Exactly. And feeling like you have to jump out of the difficult situation is, that's what leads to, that's what Glennon would tell you, is that's what led to her addiction, is I didn't know how to stay in the pain of a difficult situation. I didn't know I could make it through it. I love that she describes it as I started to practice feeling yes. all of my feelings. Yeah. Because it's something that most of us are not very good at. 
and you can't expect yourself to be good at, may never be good at, but it's a practice. And you work at it just like you work at anything else that you want to get good at. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to just take small moments and feel your feelings, no matter how uncomfortable, and prove to yourself they they pass. Everything is temporary. And then try again the next day. Another of her keys that she's dropping is dare to imagine. So she says, perhaps imagination is not where we go to escape reality, but where we go to remember it. Perhaps when we want to know the original plan for our lives, families, world, we should consult not what's in front of us, but what's inside us. And I just want to, like, this is such an easy thing to gloss over, but this is where we, imagination is where we remember reality, not where we go to escape it. And I think as someone who's often lived inside my imagination, it's very affirming to hear that, no, I think the people who are paying more attention to what could be and working toward that have a better gr- grasp on reality than the people who are obsessed with what's going on right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is, to me, what this whole book felt like was about, which was expressing your insides on the outside. Yeah. And your imagination is step one yeah. in doing that. You have to be able to imagine, I can live a more free life or I can do things yeah. that feel more aligned with who I am before you can actually go out into the world and make that happen. Mm-hmm. So your imagination is absolutely step one. It's not where it ends, but it's where it begins. Imagination, and not just in like the colorful um, kind of... Storytelling kind no, of No, no, the like... I can imagine a better reality for myself than the one that I have now. So you're going to read a section from the book. How do we start to live from our imagination? Right. The truest, most beautiful life never promises to be an easy one. We need to let go of the lie that it's supposed to be. Every woman who has begun to live from her imagination began by honoring her discontent. She did not dismiss it, bury it, deflect it, deny it, blame it on someone else, or tell herself to shut up and be grateful. She heard her knowing whisper, not this. And she admitted to herself that she heard it. She sat with it for a while. Then she dared to utter her inner whisper out loud. She shared her discontent with another human being. This is the thing because we are so eager to deny the voice of our intuition that we will not allow ourselves to imagine something better because we'll say things like, oh, no, you couldn't do that. Or shut up and be grateful. How many (laughs) fucking times have I heard women say that to each other and to to themselves? themselves. Yeah. Like, that is one of the most insidious things that we do. Honoring your discontent is so, in in all honesty, it's what our clients have to do before they can even come to us. True. True. So yeah. everyone that we're working with yep. has in some way recognized, yep. I feel discontent and I'm not going to be okay with that. I'm, I am yep. I believe I could feel different. I believe I want there's something. to believe. Yeah, even e- yes. wanting to believe is enough. Even if you're not sure you believe, yep. but you have an inkling, maybe, maybe that could be true. Yep. I hope it's true. I, I want to believe it's true. That's what brings people into the coaching space with us. And that's that's where the, the magic happens. But you yeah. have to start with recognizing I'm not that happy. I don't believe where it I has am. to be this way. And I'm willing, I'm willing to do something about it, even though it terrifies me. I'm willing to imagine a different reality than this one. And I'm willing to take a step closer to that, which means ooh, a lot of untaming, a lot of releasing mm-hmm. of programming, a lot of releasing of fears and, and expectations. But first, honoring your discontent and not trying to suppress it, ignore it, tell it to shut up. You cannot free yourself if you will not honor where you are discontent and take it seriously. There's a part in the book that I think is just so, so cool that's about imagination where uh, where Glennon was still in her marriage or, or still recently divorced. Um, and she and Abby were having these kind of shared visuals or imagination of like what life could be like. Yeah. And they hadn't actually experienced any of this together, but they would imagine, you know, walking out to the water with a mug of coffee together and like waking up and, you know, having a nice like moment, you know, looking at the sunrise together. And at first it was just imagination. It was just these like, oh, wild ideas. And 
eventually they made that a reality and they had a moment later where they're like, wow, this is what we were yeah. imagining was possible. And now we're here. Yeah. But it had to start with, can I do that? Could we can do we that? do that? Is, is that, that possible? Is that, what would have to happen? Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. So, oh, whoo, whoo, this is a good one. Here's, <laughs> here's the last key I wrote down. Build and burn. We are only alive to the degree to which we are willing to be annihilated. Our next life will always cost us this one. If we are truly alive, we are constantly losing who we just were, what we just built, what we just believed, what we just knew to be true. Ooh, this one scares me the Ooh, most. But ooh, it's so I love good. it. Oh, it's I love it. This is this is no, you got to burn it all down. This is the fire part of Clarity on Fire. <laughs> this is what I love. Yeah. I don't like it when it happens to me. Let's That's just be what clear. I mean. That's what yeah. I mean. <laughs> I do love it as a notion. I hate it when it happens to me. But yes, you are only alive to the degree to which you are willing to let things die. Yes. Which means relationships, which means versions of yourself who you used to be, which means certainty of who you thought where you thought you were going. You have to be able to let things change and grow. If you want to grow, you have to be able to let some things die. And first that has to be within yourself. You have to let some beliefs yep. die yep. to allow other new ones to grow, but then it then it has to go external. You have to let yep. relationships, you have to let jobs, you have to let all kind of external situations that are not the truest expression of you die if you want to make room for what is possible. And it is uncomfortable. Ooh. So on the note of letting things burn, mm-hmm. Glennon talks about all of the memos, kind of the, 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 you know, the societal memos you get about who you're supposed to be in order to be a good girl, like we mentioned at the beginning of this. Glennon talks about all of the memos that she had to burn in order to actually be complete and come alive. And, oh, was it a lot? A long list of things. Yes. And I think you're going to relate. So go ahead. Okay, here are all the memos she burned. I burned the memo that defined selflessness as the pinnacle of womanhood. But first, I forgave myself for believing that lie for so long. I had abandoned myself out of love. They'd convinced me that the best way for a woman to love her partner, family, and community was to lose herself in service to them. In my desire to be of service, I did myself and the world a great disservice. I've seen what happens out in the world and inside our relationships when women stay numb, obedient, quiet, and small. Selfless women make for an efficient society, but not a beautiful, true, or just one. When women lose themselves, the world loses its way. We do not need more selfless women. What we need right now is more women who have detoxed themselves so completely from the world's expectations that they are full of nothing but themselves. What we need are women who are full of themselves. A woman who is full of herself knows and trusts herself enough to say and do what must be done. She lets the rest burn. I burned the memo presenting responsible motherhood as martyrdom. I decided that the call of motherhood is to become a model, not a martyr. I unbecame a mother, slowly dying in her children's name, and became a responsible mother, one who shows her children how to be fully alive. I burned the memo insisting that the way a family avoids brokenness is to keep its structure by any means necessary— I noticed families clinging to their original structures that were very broken indeed. I noticed other families whose structures had shifted and were healthy and vibrant. I decided that a family's wholeness or brokenness has little to do with its structure. A broken family is a family in which any member must break herself into pieces to fit in. A whole family is one in which Each member can bring her full self to the table, knowing that she will always be both held and free. I decided to let my family's form become an evolving ecosystem. I unbecame a woman clinging to a prescribed family structure and became one clinging to each of her family members' right to their full humanity, including me. We would break and re-break our structure instead of allowing any of us to live broken. I quit buying the idea that a successful marriage is one that lasts till death, even if one or both spouses are dying inside. I decided that before I ever vowed vowed myself to another person, I would take this vow to myself. I will not abandon myself. Not ever again. 
Me and myself, we are till death do us part. We'll forsake all others to remain whole. I unbecame a woman who believed that another would complete me when I decided that I was born complete. Mm. How many of us have bought into some of those memos? A mother is a martyr, is selfless. A family is one that stays together at all costs, no matter how sick or terrible it feels. That in order to be a part of a family, you've got to break yourself in order to fit in. I love the notion that a family should adapt to fit you, that you should not adapt to fit the family. That— 100% agree. Because family, yeah, it's a biological thing, but it's really more of an idea. You are a person. A family is a construct. And the construct should bend to fit you. You should not bend to fit the construct. That's really what this whole fucking book is about, (laughs) right? Exactly. Not just in families, but in everything. Any construct should bend to fit you. You should not bend to fit that construct because Mm -hmm. in doing so, you abandon yourself. Mm -hmm. And that belief of, I know she was talking about motherhood as martyrdom, but I think a lot of, a lot of roles of women end up with this concept of martyrdom. Oh, sure. Right. Women women are meant to be selfless. We got a point about that coming up in a minute. (laughs) <laughs> Not quite there yet, but okay. So uh, this is the one, this is a, a particular part about her relationship, her budding relationship with Abby that I really, really liked was when she talked about how her good friend, Liz Gilbert, yes, the Liz Gilbert that we talk <laughs> about all the time and love and have done book club episode about Big Magic in the past. Liz Gilbert was one of the very first people beyond maybe Glennon's sister, the only other person who knew about her relationship with Abby. And no one knew at this point that Glennon was thinking about leaving her marriage. And so (laughs) she says, you know that story about God and the flood and how, not that one, not the Noah story, (laughs) but the one where, you know, the guy's like in a flood and he's, the water's creeping up and he's on his roof and a motorboat comes by and he's like, no, 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 you can go. God will save me. And then, like, mm-hmm. a helicopter comes by. And then, no, 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 God's going to save me. And then he drowns. And then God's like, what are you doing? Yeah, I, I sent you a boat and a helicopter. <laughs> what are you? And she goes, I started to realize maybe Liz G was my helicopter. I sent you people. <laughs> I sent you resources She's, to work this out. <laughs> because, for those of you who don't know, Liz Gilbert left her longtime marriage. The one that she wrote about in a book uh-huh. um, for a woman who then ended up dying of cancer. A few years later, her best friend, someone she'd known for 15 years. So she said, maybe God put Liz G in my house for a reason. Maybe she will understand to me. (laughs) So we sat down on my couch and I spilled it all. I told her about how Abby and I had met, how we'd spent the past weeks falling deeper in love through emails, how our letters felt like blood transfusions. Each one I read and wrote pumped fresh life through my veins. I told her how ridiculous and impossible it all was. It was thrilling and terrifying to hear the words fall out of my mouth, like I was crossing some point of no return. I was expecting her to be shocked. She was not shocked. Her eyes were sparkly, lovingly amused, soft, smiling. I can picture that look on Liz Gilbert's face. I feel like Liz Gilbert is never shocked anymore. (laughs) She looked relieved somehow. I said, it will never work. She said, maybe not. Maybe she's just an Abby-shaped door inviting you to leave what's not true enough anymore. I said, it will ruin Craig. She said... There's no such thing as one-way liberation, honey. I said, can you imagine the havoc this would wreak on my parents, on my friends, on my career? She said, yes. Everyone you love would be uncomfortable for a long while, maybe. What's better, uncomfortable truth or comfortable lies? Every truth is a kindness, even if it makes others uncomfortable. Every untruth is an unkindness, even if it makes others comfortable. I said, I barely know her. She said, but you do know yourself. I said, what if I leave for her and this isn't even real? She looked at me. She didn't say anything. We sat together in the quiet. She held my hand lightly, lovingly. I said, I'm real. What I feel and want and know, that's all real. Yes, Liz said, you're real. Hmm. Liz G just dropped eight truth bombs in that one conversation. Of course she did. That's her whole thing. (laughs) Maybe something is just an Abby-shaped hole inviting you to walk, you know, to a a truer life. I think that happens so much in life that you think you're going after one thing when really it's just a thing reminding you there's something different and better. 
And that may not here. be the thing. It may not be. It may or it may not be the thing. But and it's that's reminding not the point. you. Uh, it's showing a contrast. It's really? showing you what could be. It's showing you a contrast of where you are and what's possible and inviting you into what's possible. And in this case, Abby actually was a fantastic and is a fantastic partner for her. But that does that wasn't even the point. Yeah. The point was the possibility. There's no such thing as one-way liberation. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. When you set yourself free, you inevitably set someone else free too, even if to them at the time it doesn't feel like freedom. Mm. That's so hard to do when you love your people, but yeah, that's it's the only way. Yep. And every truth is a kindness, even if it makes others uncomfortable. Yes. Ooh, the type nine in me is like... No, it is. Feeling it very is not kind to, it is not kind to live true. a lie. It is it's not. True. It is not. It wasn't kind to her husband to continue to live a lie, even if she wasn't sure a relationship with Abby was going to work out. That it's wasn't the point. It's not kind to her kids? No. To, de- to model a relationship that is well, not the extent of what it could be? On that note, Glennon talks about that was really the thing. She mm-hmm. had gotten to a point where she had decided, I'm not going to do it. This was post-Liz Gilbert conversation, by the way. She got to a point where she decided, I can't do this. I can't do this to my kids. And she paused one day while she was doing her daughter's hair. And her daughter asked her a question about how to do her hair. And she's like, my daughter looks up to me for everything. And she's like, I'm staying in this marriage for this child, for my children, but I would never want this marriage for my children. Why am I here? So this is kind of her realization about that. The campaign to convince us to mistrust women begins early and comes from everywhere. When we are little girls, our families and teachers and peers insist that our loud voices, bold opinions, and strong feelings are too much and unladylike. So we learn to not trust our personalities. Childhood stories promise us that girls who dare to leave the path or explore get attacked by big bad wolves and pricked by deadly spindles, so we learn to not trust our curiosity. The beauty industry convinces us that our thighs, frizz, skin, fingernails, lips, eyelashes, leg hair, and wrinkles are repulsive and must be covered and manipulated, so we learn to not trust the bodies we live in. Diet culture promises us that controlling our appetite is the key to our worthiness, so we learn to not trust our own hunger. Politicians insist that our judgment about our bodies and futures cannot be trusted, so our own reproductive systems must be controlled by lawmakers who we don't know in places we've never been. The legal system proves to us again and again that even our own memories and experiences will not be trusted. If 20 women come forward and say, he did it, and he says, no, I didn't, they will believe him while discounting and maligning us every damn time. And religion, sweet Jesus. I love the (laughs) play on words there. The lesson of Adam and Eve, the first formative story I was told about God and a woman, was this. When a woman wants more, she defies God, betrays her partner, curses her family, and destroys the world. We weren't born distrusting and fearing ourselves. That was part of our taming. We were taught to believe that who we are in our natural state is bad and dangerous. They convince us to be afraid of ourselves. So we do not honor our own bodies, curiosity, hunger, judgment, experience, or ambition. Instead, we lock away our true selves. Women who are best at this disappearing act earn the highest praise. She is so selfless. Can you imagine? The epitome of womanhood is to lose oneself completely. Mm. That's a damn mic drop. (laughs) And it is so true. How many women, I think that millennials are waking up to this, but our mom's generation, this is their, this is the baggage that they have, I've seen them struggle with even more than us. Yes, definitely. I think our generation of women is a little bit more willing to question it. To question it and still to, got it programmed into them for, for well, sure. Sure. I right. mean, most of our most of our mothers were seeking modeling selflessness this. Right. Yeah. and martyrdom. Yeah. And that was what it meant to be a good mother and a good woman. Yeah. Um, so we're starting to break away from that, but man, those roots run deep. Mm-mm. So maybe let's question the memo that 
the best thing you can be as a woman is absolutely nothing, is to disappear into nothing in service of everyone Small else. Small and quiet and selfless. I say no. <laughs> um, okay. In Also about her relationship with parenting and grappling with this, like leaving and it actually being a good example for my kids, not something that's going to destroy their lives. I ask myself, is the decision to continue abandoning yourself really what your children need from you? Mothers have martyred themselves in their children's names since the beginning of time. We've lived as if she who disappears the most loves the most. We've been conditioned to prove our love by slowly ceasing to exist. What a terrible burden for children to bear, to know that they are the reason their mother stopped living. What a terrible burden for our daughters to bear, to know that if they choose to become mothers, this will be their fate too. Because if we show them that being a martyr is the highest form of love, that that's what they will become. They will feel obligated to love as well as their mothers loved, after all. They will believe they have permission to live only as fully as their mothers allowed themselves to live. If we keep passing down the legacy of martyrdom to our daughters, with whom does it end? Which woman ever gets to live? And when does the death sentence begin? At the wedding altar? In the delivery room? Whose delivery room? Our children's or our own? When we call martyrdom love, we teach our children that when love begins, life ends. This is why Jung suggested there is no greater burden on a child than the unlived life of a parent. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. I don't think you need to have children in order to appreciate this. No, not at all. This is about modeling for whether it's your children or just the people that you love in your life, that in order to really live, you have to respect yourself. You have to yes. honor your own truth and do the things that make you come alive, not do the things for other people that help them come alive and forget yes. your own aliveness. Right. The There is no greater burden on a child than the unlived life of a parent. It's just as relevant between you and your children as it is between you and your parents. Exactly. Right? Like, Putting uh, so many people I coach are feeling pressured by the expectations and the fears and the beliefs, lived and unlived, that their parents have put on them. And that is why it's a burden, is because you are then not free to live your own life. And the kindest thing you can do for another person is to let them live their own life and or to demonstrate and model to them what it looks like to live your own life. I say and. (laughs) Yeah, and, and. both, for (laughs) sure, for sure. Yes. And oh, this next part, for all of the people pleasers out there, this is going to be some tough love and permission. Yeah. Uh, This one hit me really hard. So this is a conversation that she recorded between her daughter, Tish, and herself. And she's referencing her son, Chase. Yeah, just so you know who these players are. Tish says, Chase wants me to join the same club he joined in middle school. I don't want to. Me. So don't. Tish. But I don't want to disappoint him. Me. Listen, every time you're given a choice between disappointing someone else and disappointing yourself, your duty is to disappoint that someone else. Your job throughout your entire life is to disappoint as many people as it takes to avoid disappointing yourself. Tish, even you, me, especially me. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. How many many people do you know who needed their parents to say to them, it's okay. Not if you only me. do I, not only is it okay, I but expect I expect it. you to disappoint me if it means not disappointing yourself. Yes. And you want to know what's happening? And a lot of people who are listening to this right now, they're feeling very uncomfortable and they think that is selfish. And yes. I would refer back to the point <laughs> she made earlier about how a woman's programming is telling her that the height of womanhood is to lose yourself completely and to be selfless, literally without a self. I believe, here, here's, I, I know, no, 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 I do not believe, I know, that when she says your duty is to disappoint other people, she's not talking about you being callous. She's not talking about you being mean or hoarding all of the resources or being catty. She's talking about when you honor who you are, you become a happier person, you become a more alive person, and the world needs those type of people. And someone like that only creates a positive ripple effect in the world even though it will make people uncomfortable, even though it might mean the end of relationships, because again, sometimes you got to annihilate something to start something new. But that 
the net gain of you being yourself and living a life that's actually true to yourself and that isn't, you know, in opposition to or in reaction to what other people want creates something very profound that's ultimately good for everybody. Yeah. Along that same line, I I want to clear, I don't, in case any of you are thinking the point of this is to just go out into the world and disappoint as many people as you can, that's not the point. The point is, if given the choice, if you have two options ahead of you and one is disappoint yourself and one is disappoint someone else and you can't, you have to choose one or the other. Choose yourself. You have to choose yourself because ultimately that's also choosing the other person. Yes. If you are martyring yourself for that person, that's not really serving that's them. That's not love. It's not real love. So you're disappointing yourself and ultimately you're kind of disappointing them too. Yeah. So it's a lose-lose. Yeah. The belief that it's better to lose yourself and to martyr yourself because it makes someone else happy is a short-sighted belief that kind of implies that there's no higher purpose to a relationship. That maybe disappointing them is going to be something that breaks them wide open and makes them realize, oh, wow, I could be a different person. I could be living differently. Maybe the anger that they feel in being disappointed makes them question some of their own decisions. I mean, if you continue to... to prioritize other people over yourself over and over and over again, then all that happens is you enable everyone else to not have to grow. And yourself. You keep yourself from growing and you keep them from growing. What she's really saying is choose growth every time over stagnation. Stagnation. That's what she's saying. So here's the last thing I want to read, and I will explain at the end of it why. Also, I have yet been unable to read this without crying. (laughs) So I'm probably going to cry. She wrote this as an essay for Abby. Tonight, you and I are in a minister's office somewhere in Texas. We're chatting before I go out to speak to the waiting crowd. You don't like these steepled echoing rooms. You come with me anyway. You sit in the front pew and listen to me talk about God and the hunches I have about her. You think I'm wrong to believe there's a God, but it's what you love and need me for. You borrow my faith like we borrow our next door neighbor's Wi-Fi. This minister said something that made you feel safe. You looked down at your hands and said, I don't feel comfortable in churches. When I was little, I knew I was gay. I had to choose church, my mom, and God, or myself. I chose myself. Damn right, the minister said. She cleared her throat. I smiled at her. But damn right wasn't exactly it. I turned to you, touched your hand. I said, babe, wait, yes. When you were little, your heart turned away from the church in order to protect itself. You remained whole instead of letting them dismember you. You held on to who you were, who you were born to be, instead of contorting yourself into who they told you to be. You stayed true to yourself instead of abandoning yourself. When you shut down your heart to that church, you did it to protect God in you. You did it to keep your wild. You thought that decision made you bad, but that decision made you holy. Abby, what I'm trying to say is that when you were very little, you did not choose yourself instead of God in church. You chose yourself and God instead of church. Mm -hmm. When you chose yourself, you chose God. When you walked away from church, you took God with you. Oh my God. It's so good. It's so good. Okay. (laughs) To me, I'm just like, how that applies everywhere. Because, like, that's why I picked this (laughs) as the last thing I wanted to say. It applies to everything. Take God and call it the universe or call it love or just call it like your higher self. But when she says, when you choose, when you chose yourself, you chose God. And when you walked away from church, you took God with you. That's the whole point of this book is that when you walk away from things that aren't right for you or when you have the courage to live in alignment with yourself, you take God with you. Yes. You, and God can mean righteousness. God can mean alignment. God can mean just you know, the highest and truest and most beautiful expression of who you are as a person. I don't care what you call God. I don't care if you even believe in God. But the concept of staying within myself means I take God with me wherever I go. That's the point of this book. Yeah, and and leaving whatever constructs that she's not condemning the church or or what. She's not condemning anything. No. She's just saying, if it doesn't fit you, take all of you and the best of you and the deepest truth of you and go find a construct that does fit yes. you. When you walk away from your cage, you take your freedom with you. Exactly. You are your freedom. That's what she's trying to say. That is why I had to end on that note. Because mm. that is, I mean, that's I this got... book in an essence. 
I there and like I I have to tell you, I struggled so hard to to nix things from this outline because I would have gone There's on so for two much. hours, <laughs> or I could have read the whole book for fifteen hours to you, but you could just download it and read book. it <laughs> and have Glennon read it to you. Um, so I I don't I not I not only insist that you read it, I mandate that you read it. <laughs> We, we can't uh, enforce our mandate I don't care. Anymore, but... I'm, I'm going to put out an arbitrary mandate that you read this book. And I think you should also read Love Warrior too, because they go together like peanut butter and jelly. It's like, do. you know, part one and part two of a, of a story. I know some of my clients have already read this and they've already been reaching out to me. So for those of you who haven't read it and go read it right now, or those of you who already have, and maybe you have some different parts that stood out to you than what stood out to us, please come comment. We want this to be a discussion. I want, I've always wanted to have a book club. I want to hear your thoughts. I want us to have a dialogue about this. So don't just take these parts that we chose as the best parts. Please, please, please. I want to hear your favorite parts and I want to hear your reactions. And it's okay if your reactions are mixed. You don't have to agree with everything. You don't, you're going to trust whatever comes up for you because she's going, going, she's, delves into a lot of different <laughs> arenas. She delves into family, into race, into feminism, into, I mean, just so, Lots so many stuff topics. we didn't even talk about. Yeah, we didn't even get into all of that. So I want to hear your reaction. Uh, Reese Witherspoon picked this last month for her book club. Mm, that doesn't And I me. saw, no, of course not. But I saw that she posted about it and I was reading all of the comments and they were divided evenly between women who were like, fuck yes, this book. And women who were like, I didn't really get this book. I I couldn't get into it. Now, again, to each their own. And the amount of women who were uncomfortable about this book or didn't understand this book or just couldn't quite vibe with this book made me go, yep, those are like... That's why it was needed. That's why it was needed, (laughs) right? Is that sometimes you're so deep in the programming, you can't even kind of understand that you are programmed. No, I'm not saying every single person who doesn't vibe with it is, oh, and is there's, like yeah, There's also people who just respond differently to different experts and different people sharing their stories. Styles, and that's writing fine. styles. This, this book is not written chronologically. It's written in a very essay-like kind of meandering format. I liked it. And that she actually said in an interview I listened to recently that she wrote a whole book and then scrapped it and started again because it was like more of a how-to guide to get untamed. And she goes, you know what? Instead of telling people how to get untamed, I'm just going to show them what happened with me mm-hmm. in my life. And I'm not going to just, I'm, I'm just going to make my points and let people draw their own conclusions. And so the way I wrote this book became an untamed experience. Like the book, it, the style is untamed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I love that, that the style matches the theme of the book. So, and I liked it too. It kind of bounced all over the place, but it made sense on, reminded, on a soul level, not yeah, a logical level. It reminded level. me of the style, like the the structural style of like Big Magic. Yeah. Um, where it's these little moments. Short essays. And what, what I like about that style is you can come back and sometimes you just want to read that one little yeah. story or that little moment and you don't have to, you know, go back through a whole, a whole chronological sequence. So it's so good. Please go read it. Please tell us your thoughts. And let's see. Yeah. Um, I think that what Glennon did in this book is that she handed people keys, you know, to free themselves. And that um, that's what we've been doing. That's what we like doing, too. That's why we like this book is that that's exactly we hand people keys, too. That's actually, do you know what we actually do? We remind people that they're sitting in a jail cell with the door wide open and that all they have to do is or, walk or out. Or that they've always had their own key, right? We don't the have keys to in your pocket. <laughs> you can open it and walk out if you wanted it's to. It's not my key. I'm giving it to you. I'm just showing no. you where your own key is. You had it. Yep. I just have to illuminate the fact that it's there. So, and then what do you do when you get out of the jail cell? That's yeah. the scary part, too. <laughs> yeah. Who am I going to be? Who am I going to mm-hmm. have to be? Who am I going to have to disappoint? What What's am I going to What's this gonna, new life yep. going to be like? That's it. That's what coaching is for. Mm-hmm. So we will be back on Tuesday. Tuesday with a new, I think it's a new message from the universe. I think that's right. I am. It's actually going to be our last one for a while. Not forever. No, just, just for a while. And we're going to have a new deck of cards, doing, too. Yeah, the last time we're doing it, um, you know, on a particular On a regular time schedule. Frame. All right. See you then.